the nightly business report. Good evening. Tonight, the finance ministry states that rejecting the IMF's debt sustainability analysis for Sri Lanka will result in unpredictable delays in the program. The newly constructed duty-free shopping complex at Colombo Port City has officially opened, showcasing a range of prominent international duty-free retailers. Colombo Stock Exchange closes the turbulent week with losses, with negative sentiment dominating despite a single day of gains. And Volvo Cars cuts its margin and revenue goals again abandoning its EV-only target due to tariffs and lower electric vehicle demand. From Studio 24, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for joining us. The Finance Ministry explains that refusing to work with the International Monetary Fund's debt sustainability analysis for Sri Lanka will lead to unquantifiable delays in the program with Sri Lanka. The statement said that any country can of course stand its ground and refuse to move forward based on the IMF's DSA if it disagrees with the outcomes of the model and the IMF's assessments. It further stated that the IMF would simply not be able to proceed with a financing program given its inability to lend to a country without debt, deemed unsustainable and such a standoff would not only serve to delay an agreement on a financing program for several months if not years. There have been recent reports in the media based on the public commentary that they have propagated false narratives that Sri Lanka has failed to produce its own debt sustainability analysis in engaging in debt restructuring negotiations. Such commentary is likely based on lack of familiarity with standard operating mechanisms of debt restructuring negotiations. There has also been debate on the feasibility of renegotiating the debt restructuring framework. The following sets out an accurate representation of facts in this regard. In the past, Sri Lanka has adjusted IMF program targets midway through programs. The IMF rules do not allow it to lend to countries that are deemed to have unsustainable debt. Therefore, Sri Lanka commenced the process of restructuring its debt in parallel to negotiating the macroeconomic reform program with the IMF. The mall, a newly constructed duty-free shopping complex in the Colombo Port City area, was opened by President Ranil Wickremesinghe yesterday. This marks the debut of the first urban duty-free shopping mall in the region, featuring a range of stores, restaurants and various retail outlets. Notable international duty-free retailers, including One World, China Duty-Free Group and Flamingo will be operating within the mall, positioned in the Colombo Port City as a premier shopping destination. Following the unveiling of a commemorative plaque and the official opening, the President embarked on an observation tour of the new complex. In his address at the occasion, President Rani Vikram Singh reflected on the rapid development of the Port City, noting that two years ago such progress seemed unlikely. The President also highlighted that approximately 100 companies are now interested in the Port City, with 74 expected to commence investment activities by the end of the year, and he expressed optimism about the future growth and potential of the area. With the inauguration of the new complex, the tourism industry has now gained global prominence, attracting visitors who are drawn to this new shopping complex. The development of shopping malls in the Port City is a key part of their strategy to enhance the region's appeal and provide goods for tourists. This represents the beginning of a new era for the Port City. The rising price of natural rubber has led the global rubber industry to expect a shift from natural to synthetic rubber products. Pushpika Janadira, chairperson of the Sri Lanka Association of Manufacturers and Exporters of Rubber Products and Managing Director of Dipped Products PLC, stated that this shift is unfavourable for Sri Lanka. The country doesn't manufacture synthetic rubber, meaning the entire supply must be imported, posing challenges for local industries. He pointed out that in this present context, freight rates play a very pivotal role because the rates are increasing. Therefore, the cost of manufacturing freight trade absorbs quite a higher percentage. With that, their competitiveness is challenging since they had to pay a synthetic rubber freight cost, whereas the other manufacturers have their own domestic production of synthetic rubber. Therefore, Sri Lanka has a little bit of a disadvantage cost-wise. Moreover, Sri Lanka is becoming less competitive in the global market due to the concerns about the high energy and water tariffs, the shortage of labour, the sudden rupee fluctuations and rubber raw material shortages in the country. In addition, the concerns of exchanges lowering below 300 rupees to US dollars also adversely impact Sri Lankan exporters. 
An official for the Central Bank of Sri Lanka said that the CBSL will not cash the 1.4 billion US dollar Chinese swap and will use it as a standby arrangement as Sri Lanka has sufficient foreign reserves. Speaking at the Committee on Public Finance recently, the CBSL International Operations Department Director Dr. Sumila Vanakuru said that the People's Bank of China swap worth $1.4 billion is not cashable at the moment as some conditions are not met, but will maintain it as a standby arrangement. One of the main conditions of cashing the PBOC swap was to have three months of import cover in the reserves and according to Wanaguru, at the end of July, Sri Lanka has 3.8 months of import cover in the reserves with $5,652 million. Moreover, she said that the daily average debt of foreign exchange market in Sri Lanka is about $75 to $80 million, while the liquidity reaches to low $30 to $40 million US dollars and a high of $100 million on some days. She said that the International Monetary Fund wants CBSL to have $2 billion in net purchases from the market by the end of this year and that the CBSL had net purchases of $1.87 billion by the end of the month of July. Vanaguru said that the rupee is slightly appreciating at the moment due to high inflows and low demand prevailing at the moment. Let's take a short break now. This is the Nightly Business Report. Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. The negative sentiment prevails for the second day after the Colombo stock market struck back last Wednesday with gains but was not able to maintain the momentum. The week ended on a downturn with both indices closing in the red. For a summary of the week's final market performance, we turn to Netmi Fernando from First Capital Holdings. The Colombo Stock Exchange experienced another day of losses as the ASPI closed on the red, recording at 10,776, losing 25 points due to the continued uncertainty on the political landscape in the country. Furthermore, towards the latter part of the day, the market experienced selling pressure further justifying the negative sentiment. Selected banking sector counters and blue chip companies dragged the index down, mainly Commercial Bank, Hatton National Bank, Haley's PLC and John Q's Holdings PLC. Turnover was recorded low at LKR 449.5 million, 42.4% lower than the monthly average of 781 million. Retail and high net worth participation remained relatively low during the day. Capital goods sector contributed 24%, whilst banking and food, beverage and tobacco sectors jointly contributed 37% of the overall turnover. Thank you. It was a turbulent week at the Colombo Stock Exchange with negative sentiment dominating despite a single day of gains. The market struggled to sustain any positive momentum, ultimately closing the week with losses. Well, for a detailed summary of this week's trading at the Colombo Bores, we now turn to Vinodini Rajapupati from First Capital Holdings. Thank you. The Colombo Stock Exchange commenced the week on a bearish note with the ASPI plunging to a six-month low, shedding 150 points. This downturn was driven by lingering political uncertainties and heightened market selling pressure. The index faced challenges in rebounding from earlier losses as profit taking was prevalent across banking and blue chip stocks. The banking sector, particularly key players including Commercial Bank, Sampath Bank and HNB notably contributed to the downward pressure on the index. Early in the week, retail investors remained active while renewed in interest from high net worth individuals midweek provided temporary relief halting a 12-day losing streak. However, this rebound proved short-lived as the market was unable to maintain momentum closing the week on a downward trajectory. The ASPI closed the week at 10,776, registering a 0.9% decline compared to the previous week's close of 10,869. Moreover, the average daily market turnover surged by 44% to approximately 1 billion rupees, largely driven by high net worth investors capitalizing on bargain buying opportunities. Key sectors contributing to this increased activity included 
capital goods, banking and food beverage and tobacco. Furthermore, foreign investors maintained a net buying position throughout the week, resulting in a net inflow of 3.5 million rupees. This was primarily driven by strong foreign interest for stocks in Milstar Corp, Commercial Bank and John Keels Holdings. Gold prices remained close to a one-week high today and were set to record weekly gains as investors keenly awaited U.S. jobs data that may influence the Federal Reserve's anticipated rate cut later this month. Spot gold edged up by 0.1%, reaching $2,518.49 per ounce, following a peak of $2,523.29 in the previous session. For the week, bullion has seen a gain of 0.6%. Meanwhile, U.S. gold futures strengthened by 0.2%, trading at $2,548.50. Bullion typically performs better in a low interest rate environment and is viewed as a safe asset during periods of uncertainty. Bets for a 50 basis point cut by the Fed on September 18th have risen to 41% from 34% a week ago, according to CME Group's FedWatch. Tool. The U.S. non-farm payrolls data due could provide further clarity. Oil prices inched higher during Asian trading today as investors tread carefully ahead of key U.S. employment data. They balance the impact of a significant drawdown in U.S. crude inventories against the OPEC Plus producers' decision to delay planned production hikes. Brent crude futures increased by 13 cents to $72.82, while U.S. West Texas intermediate crude futures rose by 12 cents or 0.17 percent to $69.27. Earlier in August, oil prices had fallen by over a dollar, with Brent crude settling at a seven-month low amid fears of a U.S. recession that triggered a global market sell-off. Prices later recovered as concerns over escalating conflict in the Middle East emerged. Brent crude hit a one-year low as demand concerns outweighed a U.S. inventory drawdown and OPEC plus output delays. The Sri Lankan rupee remains steady against the U.S. dollar at commercial banks in Sri Lanka today compared to yesterday. According to Commercial Bank, the buying rate decreased to 292 rupees and 20 cents, while the selling rate also decreased to 302 rupees and 50 cents. Well, now we'll take a look at the exchange rates of the rupee against other global currencies. Short break now, corporate updates right after this. This is the Nightly Business Report. Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. Sri Lanka's Commercial Bank of Ceylon, PLC, said that all procedures related to the liquidation of its subsidiary Comics Sri Lanka SRL in Italy have been completed. The bank announced the voluntary liquidation of Comics Sri Lanka, a wholly owned subsidiary located in Rome in August of 2022. The bank said in a stock exchange filing that all procedures related to the voluntary liquidation of the said Comics Sri Lanka SRL have now been completed and said Comics Sri Lanka SRL has been removed from the Chamber of Commerce, Craft, Industry and Agriculture of Rome, which acts as the registrar of companies in Italy. The duly appointed liquidator of the said Comics Sri Lanka SRL have confirmed that all liquidation formalities have been completed. Comics inaugurated its money transfer operation in Italy in the year of 2016 following the grant of a money transfer license from the Bank of Italy. It led to many Sri Lankans who had previously used informal channels to remit money to Sri Lanka using the bank's e-exchange remittance service instead and prompted the bank's decision to incorporate its own subsidiary for money transfer services. At the time, the bank planned to open branches in other Italian cities with high potential for money transfer services to Sri Lanka. Italy is one of the biggest markets for Sri Lankan migrants. 
Celebrating over 20 years of empowering Sri Lanka's youth, edX kicked off its media expo today at the Bandar Naika Memorial International Conference Hall in Colombo. Building on the success of the main edX expo held earlier this year, the mid-year expo continues to offer a wealth of opportunities for aspiring students and job seekers. The expo will be open to the public from today until the 8th of September, which is coming Sunday, and there will be no entrance fee charged. This year's event will feature over 150 education stalls and 25 job fair stalls, including prominent tertiary education, vocational training and skills development institutes, along with leading corporate entities. Attendees will have the access to a diverse range of options in higher education, training, employment and entrepreneurship. The Expo will showcase a variety of higher education institutions, both local and international, with the representation from countries like Australia, Japan, Canada, Malaysia and Germany. edX Chairman Mahinda Galagadari emphasized that the edX Media Expo is an ideal opportunity for the youth who have just completed their London O-Levels and A-Levels and they encourage those in higher education sector to maximize on this platform. As usual, the Media Expo will also host a job fair with top Sri Lankan companies offering on-site interviews and immediate recruitment opportunities. edX Careers will provide psychometric testing to help students and job seekers of all ages finding their ideal career paths. Meanwhile, Mogo Media Academy is pleased to announce its role as a platinum sponsor at the edX Media Expo 2024. They invite visitors to visit their stall for a unique opportunity to engage with industry experts and academic professionals. As a part of their participation, Mogo Media Academy is offering an exclusive promotion where the registration fee of 50,000 rupees will be completely waived off for those who take advantage of this offer at the Expo. The Academy provides specialized one-year diploma programs in VFX, animation, game development, texturing and modeling and concept art. They encourage visitors to explore these programs and discover the exciting career possibilities within the media industry. The grand finale of the 2024 edition of the Spark Skilled Youth Entrepreneurship Competition was celebrated yesterday. This national platform for Sri Lanka's next generation of entrepreneurs empowered five finalists from both the school and open categories to showcase their innovative business ideas. The event culminated in the crowning of this year's winners. The annual Spark Skilled Youth Entrepreneurship Competition is organized by the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce with the support from the International Labour Organization, South Asia Leadership in Entrepreneurship Project and funded by the U.S. Department of State. During the competition's first round, 100 contestants were selected from a diverse pool of applicants across two categories. The selected participants navigated a rigorous skill development process including virtual training, residential boot camp, one-on-one -on -one mentoring and business pitching sessions. The business pitches by the top six finalists were a highlight of the event, with each contestant introducing their ideas to a panel of judges. The judges then announced the winners, awarding trophies and certificates to the winners and the runners-up. This year's diverse range of entries, from tech solutions to eco-friendly products, showcases the boundless creativity and potential for our youth. In addition to the main entrepreneurship competition, for the first time, Spark 2024 also recognized young journalism talents with awards for Spark Young Entrepreneurship Journalist and Spark Young Entrepreneurial Journalist. Nine Wells Hospital has further strengthened its commitment to serving the nation by renewing its Memorandum of Understanding with the National Insurance Trust Fund. This agreement, which was signed recently, enhances the existing partnership aimed at improving access to quality health care for government employees covered under the Agrahara Insurance Scheme. The renewed MOU outlines collaborative efforts to streamline service delivery, promote preventative care and introduce special discounts on various health care services including maternity admissions, pediatric surgeries, gynecology and other surgeries, fertility treatments, laboratory and radiology services. Let's take a short commercial break. Global updates coming on the other side. This is the Nightly Business Report. Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. 
Investors in Asia wrapped up a turbulent week with hopes for a calmer day ahead, though they remain cautious about underlying U.S. growth concerns. Next week promises to be pivotal with the U.S. economic and policy landscape potentially presenting significant challenges. Today's U.S. employment data released after Asia's market close will likely set the tone for global markets until the Federal Reserve's interest rate decision and updated economic projections are unveiled on the 18th of September. Japan's Nikkei has dropped 5% this week and may face further declines if the yen continues to strengthen. The dollar fell below 143 yen yesterday for the first time since the 5th of August, with momentum suggesting a continued downward trend. Wall Street experienced a volatile day of trading, resulting in a mixed performance across the major indexes. Investors are eagerly awaiting the release of the comprehensive non-farm payrolls data, which is anticipated to play a crucial role in setting the stage for the Federal Reserve to potentially start reducing interest rates later this month. A choppy day of trading on Wall Street Thursday led to a mixed performance for the major indexes. The Dow fell about half of 1%, while the S&P 500 dropped three-tenths and the Nasdaq gained a quarter of one percent. Stocks were mostly higher earlier in the session after economic reports helped allay concerns of labor market deterioration. The focus shifted later in the day to Friday's key jobs report, which will likely set the stage for the Federal Reserve to begin cutting interest rates later this month. Stocks on the move included Tesla, which rose about five percent, after it said it will launch its full self-driving advanced driver assistance software in the first quarter next year in Europe and China, pending regulatory approval. And shares of JetBlue Airways added 7% after the carrier raised its third quarter revenue forecast. Swedish automaker Volvo Car slashed its margin and revenue ambitions for a second time in a year, a day after it abandoned its EV-only target as the impact of tariffs and reduced demand for electric vehicles continue to hurt. Volvo slashed its margin and revenue ambitions for the second time in a year on Thursday. It comes a day after the Swedish car maker, which is majority owned by China's Geely, gave up on its electric vehicle only target due to the impact of tariffs and lower demand for EVs. EU, US and Canadian tariffs on electric cars made in China have made market conditions increasingly difficult for automakers. Overall demand for EVs has also slowed, partly because of a lack of affordable cars. Volvo Cars lowered its targets for operating profit margin, excluding joint ventures and associates, to 7-8% to from above 8%. It also scrapped the sales goal of up to $58.4 billion, instead saying it expected to outgrow the premium car market. Volvo walked back margin and revenue goals on another occasion earlier this year. In January, it gave up a target for annual sales of 1.2 million cars annually by mid-decade, which was first announced three years ago. Shares in Volvo cars were up 3% early Thursday, having fallen sharply the previous day on news of the abandoned EV target. And with that, we mark the final bulletin of the nightly business report for this week. We'll see you again on Monday with the latest happenings across the business globe. Until then, I'm Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Thank you very much for watching. Have a great weekend.